Thank you again for joining us here on the Plastic Cup. Um, it, I don't know if you've gotten to catch all, all the other episodes, but if not, you should try to look back and try to meet some of the ladies of our CBC family. Um, I've learned a lot, actually. I, I, some, you know, most of these ladies I feel like I've, I've known fairly well, but I actually learned a lot of new things. So hopefully you'll be able to learn some new things about them, too. Um, again, this is just kind of an opportunity for us ladies to sit down and have um, conversation, kind of during this weird quarantine time that we find ourselves in. And hopefully you all get to join in also. And then when we can gather back together, we'll have new things to share. And hopefully our stories would have intersected in different ways that we weren't expecting. So I have a really special guest with you today. Her name is Debbie Bishop. And she has become a fast friend. Um, you helped us paint, wasn't it? One of the I first helped, times yes. I yep. met you. And Debbie, if you ever meet her, she is a ball of energy. My kids in particular, who are also highly energetic, <laughs> love Debbie and in fact she babysat once and they were over the moon excited to have her because she was such full of energy and they love that they feed off of it so I was I let them do anything they wanted this is so true that was this is true they <laughs> love it they're a girl after their own heart um, I told her husband Tim later on I said I'm not sure who was watching who <laughs> that night but um, she also was super sweet she helped paint I think it was Ellie's room wasn't it Ellie's room and my Ellie is gonna be 10 next month and she wanted a she had asked, she's never had her own room before we moved here and she wanted a light pink room with Paris we've never been to Paris I'm not exactly sure where that came from but so I was like okay well I was telling Debbie about it and here she goes and finds these perfectly matched curtain or like material the fabric yep. and she did the blackout shades and everything and Ellie loves them and in fact it's it's, it's God because my mother-in-law had bought I think for her birthday or Christmas that next time like uh, bedroom set like a quilt comfort yep. and it literally looked like it came almost from the exact same material I know, that so was I think that was God but anyway that's Debbie she's always ready to give a helping hand she's been honestly I, we've prayed together and she's been an encouragement to me that way so I think it'll be a treat for you to hear from her um, so Debbie if you don't mind just kind of introducing yourself a little bit tell a little bit where you've been your background and things like that okay um, well I was born in Bronxville New York which is right outside of New York City and I was raised in Connecticut and we moved up to Rochester, New York, where I graduated from high school. And as soon as I went away to college at Kansas State, my parents moved to um, Colorado, mm -hmm. Colorado Springs. So I moved to Colorado Springs after a year and a half at Kansas State. I joined a sorority there and I, I loved it. But they said, since you don't know what you want to do, you need to come home. So I went to Colorado State. I didn't graduate till I was like 25. And I got a degree in psychology and nutrition. And then I realized I was I waitress for a year. And I had to wear this granny outfit. And it was so humiliating. I was living at home. I was like 25. And so I was walking across um, campus one time. And I thought, I'm going to be a home ec teacher. So I went back and got my teaching certificate in home ec. And all my hours of waitressing counted as food service. So it just seems like the sewing and the cooking and the relationships and the psychology all came together. So I taught home ec um, in Colorado Springs for 10 years. And in the meantime, my parents, well, my parents divorced, but then my mom moved back east, my sister was back east, my brother was back east. So I quit my job, moved back to New England and stayed there from 96 to we moved down here in 2015. So I was there for, what, 19 years. And I taught home ec, and then they cut the program. So I went back and got my master's in, um, it was called Consulting Teacher of Reading. So I was a literacy specialist for 11, 11 years. And then I've been an interventionist for the past seven. So I've um, been around. Tim and I got married in 2010 in Massachusetts. So we've, we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year. Happy anniversary, yeah. that's exciting. Yeah. yeah, it's been fun. I love when you talk about like, you did all these things and you're like, oh, and I think I wanna be a home ec teacher. And you're just like, and I just did it. But <laughs> if you meet Debbie, she gets up in her mind, she just goes for it. Right, so. well, and actually this, I, I was in, my, in college in my 20s and then I got my other, my first master's in my 40s and then I just, pat, I just graduated from Liberty with uh, life coaching. So I'm, um, 
a life coach, so if anyone wants to be my guinea pig, I'm <laughs> saying please call me because I'd love to help, you know, mostly women working yeah. on ways to improve their health and wellness. And I took a class on marriage coaching and financial coaching and the you know, health and wellness, so. You also have been part of mentoring with the Hope Line and things like that, right? Yeah, um, Tim and I are Hope Coaches yeah. for the Hope Line. And how long have you been part of that ministry? Um, I started that in, I think, 2011. We came okay. down here, actually, to tour the um, Hope Line and work, but um, even before that, I think it was before we got married in 2009, I decided um, to be a Hope Coach. And it was on the phone. I really like being on the phone. And now we're just chatting with kids. But it's kids from, well, not kids, but 13 to 29-year-olds. And then actually, I had a 50-year-old a couple of weeks ago. Tim's had 60-something-year-olds. So they've opened it up to all ages. So you both kind of life coach in that we way. We do, yeah. yeah. That's we, exciting. Yeah, it's been That's fun. Exciting. Um, well, you're here on the Plastic Cup, yes. which I'm so thankful. And so with that, we usually just talk a little bit about, I have each guest bring their favorite cup because I think it's fun. It kind of um, shows a little personality and tells a little bit more about their life. So Debbie, do you want to share what cup sure. you brought? Sure. <laughs> I brought my English grammar and punctuation. <laughs> um, this is really fun to bring to my, my students. I don't let them touch it because it ended up being, I think this is like, I don't know, it was expensive because <laughs> I ordered it from England and um, it has all types of things, colon, adverbs, verbs, compound words, or compound, uh, yeah, compound words, um, what is it, pronouns, everything. And then on the inside it gives little rules about, you know, I before E. So that's my cup. I love well, it. Kids will probably be fighting over it during test day. I know it. Tea. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, Good, good. I love that cup. And I actually like English and grammar. I'm not a big fan of, I wasn't a big fan of literature growing up, but I loved grammar. Yeah. I, I loved doing the like, the little, what are they called? The Dissecting the, the sentences. Diagrams. Diagramming oh, the sentences. They just yeah. always look so nice. I, and I have my ruler out. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> I like that cup. That is funny. Um, so I brought a cup that my husband had gotten this cup from a roommate who was, I don't know the major, but basically worked in the arts and pottery and stuff. And so it was a roommate of his and he bought it for me and I've actually amazed that it stayed around all these moves and stuff yeah. later but it's one of my favorites so oh, anyway um, can you share you talked a little bit about Tim um, can you share kind of how you and Tim met because it's very unique in a very special way um, and two, just your cross country adventure mm -hmm. and different things like that go mm -hmm. ahead and share that well um, I like I said I moved back east in 96 and I was always sort of struggling with Am I going to have a job, or you know, am I, am I going to stay here? And I just had a lot of uncertainty. I joined a church actually in '98, and um, I dated a little, but nothing really stuck. <laughs> Thank goodness. And uh, so in 2003, after grad school, I went on a dating website. It was called Love and Seek, and I think we either had a $10 membership or it was free for like a month. Mm -hmm. And I met Tim. And uh, he wanted um, a friendship, and I was looking for a serious relationship. I remember that from the, and he did, I don't think he had a picture at the time. What made you like, because I'm guessing those dating websites have a lot of different people, what made right. you, what drew you to him in particular? I, I think being a Christian okay. was really important, and that he wanted a friendship. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of times guys are like, you know, yeah. wanted something else. So that was really nice. And so we corresponded for a year online. And in 2004, we met July 24th. And um, we met and he we went biking. So I had my bike and I had my little outfit on. And he comes in with shorts and a t-shirt, like a polo shirt. He didn't look, <laughs> he didn't look like a biker at all. He's here, so I know. Yeah. So <laughs> So we bicycled, and it was really a cool ride. It was all covered bridges, and we met this guy that came and chaperoned us. He said, can I f go along with you guys? And it wasn't really a date, mm -hmm. so we were like, okay. And then afterwards, we went to dinner, and we just kept in touch. And then we saw each other. He was up in Maine, and I was in Massachusetts, so we saw each other maybe once 
in a while. It didn't really get serious. And I was dating some other people, and I think he was looking for some other people too. And <laughs> so it just was amazing. Mm -hmm. But we, he came down to Massachusetts. We turned 50 in 2007, mm -hmm. and we are very close. And I'm older than him by 15 days. So we came down, and we ended up celebrating our 50th birthdays. And he drove down and sp spent some the night somewhere in Massachusetts. And I remember he hugged me goodbye and I didn't want him to go. And my heart kind of pitter pattered there and then it kept on happening. And then he proposed in 2010. So that's like three years later. Mm -hmm. And we just had this firm foundation of a friendship. And I was kind of shocked when he proposed. I was like, really, you want to marry me? <laughs> it was on top of the ma a mountain in Maine, Acadia National Park. And that was April of mm -hmm. 2010. And then we got married in June, two days after school was out. And then he, when he proposed, he said, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing because he w retired from his mm -hmm. um, job. And he said, how about if we bicycle across the country? I'm like, sure. So we didn't have any equipment. We didn't, I mean, here we're re getting ready for a wedding. And I'm so excited more about the bicycle trip than the actual, you know, day of the yeah. wedding. Because I knew, you know, marriage was more important than the actual wedding day. And I, we had some people, we had about 94 people at, for the wedding. Mm -hmm. And everyone was giving us gift cards for REI mm -hmm. and L.L. Bean and all this stuff. So we um, took off in July of 2010 and we were gone for, I think it was 47 days and we biked across the whole country, 63 days. You should have brought your one. book. Can I show I them the book? Yeah. What's, well, go ahead and tell them the title of your book if they want to know more about that adventure. Well, so we wrote our first book was To Our Better, Midlife Newlyweds Bicycle Coast to Coast. And then we did another bike ride in two years later. We biked from Florida to Maine on our mom to mom tour. And my mom lived in Florida. His mom was in Maine. She um, had died that January. But um, we bicycled to her graveside. And it was a beautiful um, ride. That w it wasn't our favorite because there was so much traffic up the East Coast. But that was really fun. And then the third trip was the Hope Line tour. Okay. And we flew out to Oregon and, f and rode our bikes all the way to Pennsylvania. And we wrote um, Wheels of Wisdom, um, Life Lessons for the Restless Spirit. And that's more of a devotional. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I've read the first book, and, and it's fascinating. If you are interested in what a cross-country bicycle trip would look like, you need to read their book. Um, I loved it. I loved the stories, and I was, I'm part of the way through their second book, their devotional book, and they're both very good. So if you want to pick it up, it'd be worth it. Um, how did you how did you come to know Christ? I mean, you, talk, well, you and I personally have talked a lot about yeah. different things in family, but I think you know it's a neat story, and I'd love for you to share that. Sure, um, I actually did share it at church one time. They had a women's ministry breakfast, um, but I. I grew up in going to church. I, then in eighth grade, I was in Rochester, New York, Pittsburgh, and we ended up, I ended up going to a coffee house, and they gave us The Way, the Bible. It was in the 70s, mm -hmm. and um, I read The Good News for Modern Man, and, but I, and I might have asked Jesus into my life. I just do not remember. Mm -hmm. Then at Kansas State, I joined that sorority, and I would, like, drink with my sorority sisters. But then on my floor in the dorm, I had some Christian mm -hmm. friends. And I remember them more than the other people. And they talked about the Lord, and I don't think I ever made a commitment then. What but stuck out to you about them at that time? Their, their kindness, okay. their, just their love. Like there was a lady, um, Laura Burnett, and she was just so gentle and kind. And another girl, Joyce, who was across the hall. And we had so much fun. And they had like genuine fun. They didn't have to drink or anything. Yeah. They just had a good time. And so they, that stuck with me. Um, but then through my 20s, I, um, I, was, I, in, I was 14 when I had an eating disorder and I got down to 81 pounds. And no one knew what was wrong with me. So my 20s, I was a mess, a real mess. And then I start teaching all this stuff, self-esteem, values, goals, decision-making, um, drugs and alcohol abuse. And here I'm drinking and I get pregnant twice in my 20s. And so I, I was a mess. So I was starting to search for meaning at like 28, 29, 30. 
and a lady came into my classroom and was talking about alcoholism mm -hmm. and, I, and so I went to these alcohol awareness classes and around 29 I stopped the bulimia 30 I went to my first AA meeting and um, I was going to all these workshops and I met this woman Marilyn and I didn't know she was a Christian and I actually didn't like Christians at all in Colorado Springs like when I went to get a pregnancy test all these men were outside protesting and they were all from Focus on the Family and I was like ah you know I was just yeah. so mad and so it was kind of a shock that I became a Christian because I called Marilyn in February of 1989 and I said I need to talk to you mm -hmm. and so I started therapy with her and she said Debbie you keep on mentioning your abortions mm -hmm. I think we need to deal with those mm -hmm. So I had to name my children. I named them Leah and Jonathan, which are both in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. And I wrote them letters apologizing for killing them. And I mean, it was gut-wrenching, this therapy. And so April of 89, she said, let's talk. Oh, and she gave me Psalm 139 to read. And I read that every day in th those three months. And I was like blown away by those words. Of Jesus or of God and um, so April I walk in and she said we're going to do a guided meditation and she never mentioned Jesus mm -hmm. and so she said picture your higher power and I I said I closed my eyes and I'm like it's Jesus like he came walking out of Planned Parenthood with my babies in his arms mm -hmm. I mean it was the most unbelievable thing I never expected that and so we talked and she's writing everything down and I'm crying and she's crying and and she you know he forgives me he has my babies in heaven with him and um, at the end of it she said is there anything else you want to ask him and I said I want to ask him into my life and so then at the end of the meditation I pictured him like this is all in my mind and I picture him going up into heaven with my two babies in his arms and um, I remember going to uh, dinner that night with my friends that I'd done all this um, AA work with, and I said, Linda, I asked Jesus into my life today, and I feel like I'm walking on water. Mm -hmm. And so that was unbelievable, um, and that just started my journey of really recovery. And um, several years later, I moved back east. I ended up um, going through this freedom of Christ, th freedom in Christ with the pastor's wife and this other lady. Mm -hmm. And I told them my story, all the stuff I just told you. And at the end of it, um, there were some cool things that happened in that. There, the lights went out in the middle of my, um, you know, all the things that we were doing. And they came back on at the end. And then Martha Feaster, the lady I was with, said, Debbie, those babies gave birth to your relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I will never forget that. So that was really how I came to Christ. And then just the steps of recovery all along the, the way. I wanted to volunteer at the pregnancy center in Massachusetts, and they wouldn't let me because I'd had abortions. They said, you need to go through the post-abortion mm -hmm. healing. So I did that and um, had more healing through that. And I, I just have had some really amazing times. And I, st I did go to church um, starting in 98 mm -hmm. and then have been involved in church ever since. Well, this next question kind of is goes on the coattails of what you just talked about, but how has your story impacted your mission in life? Because I know you are very mission oriented. Um, you are all about relationships and people, and it becomes very evident when I'm getting to know you. Um, but you're very focused in certain ministries, and can you kind of explain how your story has impacted those things? Sure. Um, after the ab post-abortion healing, they asked me to speak at their banquet. I, I think that was in 2015. And um, that was an amazing experience. Um, I spoke to probably three or four hundred people. I was like, I couldn't believe I did that. And then they, they had two nights of the banquet, so I spoke those two times. And then one time at church, uh, they asked me to speak in at a woman's retreat. And it was called um, Jesus, your, your One True Love. Mm -hmm. And that was really neat because a lot of healing came from that, like people that heard us. There was five of us that gave our testimony. And so I shared my testimony there. 
And so I just, I think just wanting women to heal. And I think the biggest thing that I went through before I got to church, AA and 12-step recovery groups are very honest. And so when I came to church and people weren't sharing mm -hmm. their hearts, I was like, what's the deal with that, you know? So I think my, my mission and my desire is to have women come together mm -hmm. to in a safe place mm -hmm. where they can share their stories. And that's what I love what you're doing because it's so important to share your story because that's where the healing comes. So in, in all your years of, of going through different things like this and, and you've been getting good help and different things, like what are some of the most helpful things that you found people either have shared or, or, or showed you? You know, you even talked about in, back in college what, what stuck out to you was their kindness and things like that, little things like that. And, and then just to encourage and challenge our church and, and just Christians in general on this day, like what, are, what do you feel are some good things that we can implement and do or do a little better um, with this whole mission of honesty and vulnerability and, and healing? Yeah, that's a great question. The first thing that comes to mind is when I was getting over my eating disorder, I called this psychiatrist mm -hmm. and he said, my homework was you have to go tell someone about your eating disorder to get over the shame. Mm -hmm. And so I think really telling someone, even if it's one person, to get the shame out, you know, I think that's really important. Um, some other things that really helped were oh, just when I went through the post-abortion healing, the women, I was the only person in this class. Mm -hmm. And so I had the undivided attention <laughs> of the leader and the co-leader and then this trainee. So there is the four of us and just being able to share about Jesus, like talking about what Jesus does in people's lives, the forgiveness, the grace, being truthful, like that's where the healing comes in. So I, I think that was really important too. And, and I remember when I was going through, I did a lot of recovery on my own. Mm -hmm. And my friend said, it, you know, years later, she said, Debbie, you needed a, a shoulder to cry on. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's so important. I would love to be some, that person that someone could just say, I need to get this off my chest. Can I just come and cry on your shoulder? Because that's also where the healing comes in, is grieving the losses, you know, from the past. I think, you know, it's just really sad what, what happens to people when they either have a lot of shame or a lot of guilt and they don't have any place to let it out. And like you said, that's kind of the first step is being able mm -hmm. to name it yeah. and to, you know, start there yeah. and to deal with that. Um, if you could share any advice to your younger self, <laughs> I think if I had to answer this question, I'd have a whole journal full. Um, what would that be? Um, and it could be more than one. Yeah. I know it's hard to narrow Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wrote some <laughs> things. I said, I read John Piper's book, uh -huh. Don't Waste Your Life, okay. and that really got to me mm -hmm. because I think, gosh, I wasted so many years trying to figure it out on my own when I really needed to just come to the cross. Yeah. So I really wish that I had just come to Jesus earlier. Mm -hmm. um, something he's working on me lately, because I am sort of a free spirit, and I just think um, on our bike trips, Tim did a lot. He did all the navigating, <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'd sit there on my bike and sing and praise the Lord and all that, but I wish I'd paid more attention to where we were. So I think having a plan, and I, I've been doing that lately, Lord, what do you want me to do today? And just opening that up, and it may be totally different from what I, what I thought it would be, but it's just kind of a cool thing to do is to have a plan. And I'm sure there's a lot of moments and relationships and things that we can all look back and feel very wasted. But even even through these stories, one thing I've found, the very common thread is, I think we all have those feelings of, I wish I could have changed that. But you see how even your mission now and how deeply you're passionate about it, I think right. it comes from some of those ashes that were in your life, oh, you know, definitely. and God's created it such beauty and, and help for other people. So um, again, I mean, I feel like for us, definitely we're, we live on a timetable, you know, we all have X amount of years. God doesn't work like that. Right. And so I think it's exciting to see how what we feel is wasted, God redeems and makes beautiful and puts pieces back together in a way we couldn't have imagined. Right. Well, and that's the thing, like when I think about, I'm working with a life coach right now and she's written a book and I'm going through the exercises. And one of the exercises is um, write down what, ask Jesus 
and the Holy Spirit and God the Father, what were they thinking when you were born? Mm -hmm. What was their plan? And it is such a cool exercise. And one of the things that, now I'm gonna space out, but they said something like, um, we thought that you would like to write more than you do, but we thought that you would be um, helping women in, the, in your 60s and 70s. And, maybe, and they didn't say 80s or 90s, but mm -hmm. I'm just going with the 60s or 70s, you know? Yeah. And he gave me that verse. I was going to read that. Sing, O barren woman, who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have never not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married. And my students always ask, why didn't you ever have children? I go, well, I got married at 52. It was a little <laughs> late to have children, but God has blessed me with so many students over the years. Like th I've had probably over a thousand students in 34 years of teaching. So let, talk about abundance. Yeah, That's I love cool. the idea of just our, the Christian community being a family. Yeah. And that even if you've never um, physically mothered children that you have right here today, yeah. like there's spiritual mothering all over the place and parenting and grandparenting and all that sort of thing. And those of us who have kids, we need it. Right. We, need, right. we need your help. I love that you take an interest in my girls in particular and that you speak truth to them. And um, I know I've had people, I had someone actually that reminds me a little bit of you, just her energy. She was a single missionary for many, many years. And she actually spoke a lot of truth and life in me. And I feel she's one of my game, I call them game changers. I have a few people that I can look back and say they were a game changer. And some of them are saved and some of them are not, but the impact they made in my life and how they made me think and feel changed something inside of me and, and changed like a direction. And, I'm, and she's one of those for me. And so I look at that for my children and I hope that they have people like you in their lives to be game changers, mm -hmm. to come into their life, reinforce what we're saying as parents, but just living it out in front of them. And I think that's super powerful. Mm -hmm. So. Please, if you haven't got a chance to meet Debbie and speak with her, she obviously has a wealth of wisdom. She's got, I don't know, how many degrees do you have now? Oh, two. <laughs> two? It seems three. And okay, always three. going on, <laughs> always going for more books written, cross-country uh, trips. So her and Tim both have uh, lots of wisdom and lots of experience. So please, let this just start a conversation with Debbie. And those who have not gotten a chance to meet her, please come meet her. I am so excited, and I hope that these episodes um, when we come back together, we'll just make it feel not awkward. Right. Like we know each other yeah, on a different level. So yep. well, thank, thank you. you. For doing this. Absolutely. We're glad to have you. Thanks for joining us again.